I work a company called Genentech. I've been with the company for now almost 12 years. I'm one of the heads of informatics, a very male-dominated department, I must say. So it's an honor as a woman of color, as a Muslim woman, to be one of the leaders there. But that's just my title. To get there, it's been quite a remarkable journey. And um, every time, you know, when I'm asked that do I feel any fear coming up when you're speaking about yourself, and I will say every time, even though I've spoken quite a few times, every time I have fear coming up. Even right now, I can hear my heart beating. And it's, it's common, it's normal, it's a human reaction. But um, I was talking to my mom earlier this morning and I was like, oh gosh, what am I gonna to talk to them about? And all she said to me, there are people just like you, just like me. And I'm not gonna talk about my accomplishments and my, uh, all my education, how I did this and that, no, I think I want to talk to you about one of the most um, strongest emotion I still have a challenge with at this age and time, and that's fear. And how courage was one of the pillars I had to embrace uh, to these defining moments I'm going to share with all of you. So imagine a girl who was quite opposite to what her um, culture expected her to be, uh, a girl that was told that a woman can never be a leader, and that uh, education was something that she can dream of. And yes, I'm not in my 50s or 40s, I'm in my early 30s, but I lived through those times. And um, I imagine this girl who had to stand before a paternal grandfather was told that education is no, there's no use for her uh, and her sisters. And imagine this girl as a young adult who was called out uh, in her college back home and in, a, in a class of almost 80 men and five girls um, in an engineering class. And she was told that she was wasting her time here. Her kind should be at home cooking and cleaning. Um, but you know, life has um, different plans for you and life and Allah sends people towards you that you never imagined having and they help you be the person that you are today. And those two remarkable human beings have been my mother and my grandmother. I don't think I'll ever be able to find the right words to express what my mother has done for me and my sisters. But just in short that she has saved me in every possible way a girl can be saved. And my grandmother, um, all I'm gonna say is that she is my best friend. She'll always be my best friend. And um, she always reminded me that I am the son that my mother never had, uh, the warrior that she never had in my lowest points in my life. And I held those words and my mother's commitment to my education very close to my heart. So this girl did finally get to go to college and I think it was, I think it was my final year, yeah. It was in my final year when my marriage was arranged. And I'm gonna be honest, I was so excited. So excited that I'm gonna get, get, get to have my fairy tale wedding and my fairy tale marriage. I know guys, I was very young, I was 21 when that happened. And it was far from fairy tale. That's all I'm gonna say. It was far from fairy tale because it was the beginning of quite an abusive marriage. Um, I tried my best in every possible way I could to save that marriage, first of all. And career and um, ambition, oh, that was not even in my mind at that point. And everything, every time something fell apart, I always used to play, lay the blame on myself, that I need to fix this, it's my responsibility, I need to put this together. Yet it was something that wasn't just my own or something that I had to fix, but that's how I was. And I believe it was in 2008, when Fear and I came face to get face after quite some time, and it was with the news that my best friend, my grandmother, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And I still remember that moment that it was hard to accept. It was hard to understand when you have so much of the losses going on, especially that time my marriage. So to accept that somebody who you love so much is going through this. But you know how um, we, just like everybody who's desperate to find cure for the cancer for their loved ones, um, we were desperate, we tried to get her right treatments, we tried everything, and we defeated cancer. Just like I had read in books, I was the warrior that she always imagined me to be, and we defeated cancer. 
and that was for a very limited time for um, it was in 20, 2009 when um, I was sitting by myself in my home after I had faced uh, not such a good scenario with my husband with an ice pack to my face and I remember my aunt called me in the late hour it was I think around 1 a.m. in the morning and she all I heard the words uh, it's back it's back the cancer was back uh, six months after she got her first, uh, after the first time we actually defeated it. And I just couldn't comprehend what was going on. I just kept repeating these words to myself over and over again that, um, why her? She promised she'll be with me. Why is this happening to her? Why is this happening to me? Haven't I faced enough? And I still remember the last time when I spoke to her. She said something to me quite profounding, which I still look back and go like, I don't know how or where she knew that from. She said that if God took something from you that you never imagined losing, it's because something so much better for you that you never imagined having. It was the very next day at 5, 11 a.m., the cancer won and took my best, best friend away from me, the great Surya Yunus. We talk about mental health. We talk about... Um, suicidal thoughts, depression, clinical depression. This woman right here faced through all of that, including suicide thoughts. And I'm not ashamed to say it out loud. Um, but I had choices. Either I could let that darkness consume me completely, or I would do something about it. And I'm so glad I chose the latter. So in order to do something about it, and in order to save my marriage, that was completely falling apart in 2010, um, my uh, husband and I, we at that, at that time were called to this fascinating country, a country that was foreign to us at this language, and that's the United States. And when, I, when we got here, I, this woman right here never held a job in her life because I got married in my final year of graduation, never ever had a job in her life, never held a job in her life. So for her to even face a world that's called corporate world, no way. There is no way. I can't even. I can't even do that. So imagine how much fear and I were like this at that time. But I had to because we were living in the Bay Area. It's not easy. It's expensive here. So I knew I had to get out there and put, and get the right job. And it was the summer of 2010 when I got um, a call from this quite a fascinating company called Genentech. I was beyond surprised. You're inviting somebody who has no experience. Nothing whatsoever. Would you want to come for, want me to come for an interview? Okay. And at that time, I think they had a campus building in Redwood City. It's no longer there now anymore, unfortunately. But um, I remember I was standing outside the building, constantly fixing my scarf, brushing my pants, and just making sure that I look I look okay. And I remember I took a couple of deep breaths, opened the door, and went inside the building. And I was greeted by this remarkable human being by the name Bob Albert who I did know at that time was gonna be my manager. And he welcomed me with a big smile and warmth and said, welcome to Genentech. And I didn't realize that was the beginning of a whole new journey. Because after that, honest speaking, the way I grew and evolved and was surrounded by people who have lifted me up, uh, bold me enough, empowered me enough to walk away from marriage that was never meant to be saved. Uh, after that, I swear, I thought this was it. I've conquered all my fears. I have empowered myself. Yay, this is it. But little did I know that life had other plans for me. Life always is mystery, right? And it has always other plans for you. And at this time, you all might remember this time as well. Remember 2016, when this entire country was shaken by a growing hostile political movement and rise of anti-migration. And this time, my safety and my family's safety, people like me and their safety, was getting questioned. Uh, my identity, how I appeared, was turning into shame. I was ashamed of being seen as a Muslim. I was ashamed of showing up and at work and being seen as a Muslim, even though that environment there was far from what I had imagined. The, the openness, the warmth, the welcome, the acceptance, I always felt there. But you know, there's a psychological thing in your mind, right? You start questioning yourself, your being, my identity, my, my customs, everything was just turning into shame. 
um, I started standing behind folks at the train station because I was just so afraid some psychotic person or lunatic would just push me in front of it. And that's because those were the scenarios I was getting to hear across the globe. Um, and I remember it was such a heartbreaking conversation with my mother who um, wanted nothing more than the well-being of her daughters and the safety of their daughters when uh, she was honestly being very open that we do not wear what we call this, it's our headscarf. Uh, just for that so we can be safe and we won't be seen as Muslims. And that was the first time that I really just paused and questioned myself, why am I ashamed of who I am? And that was the, that was the start of a whole other journey that I embarked on becoming uh, a clinical psychologist because I wanted to work with men, women, teenagers, children, uh, whether it's from our background or from our community or outside of our community, just to help them accept their fear and face that fear, not be ashamed of who, who they are and challenge the, the surrounding, the thinking of the people around them. Uh, and it's amazing, right? When you, when you help someone that capacity, you also find questions, the answers to the questions that, I, that you're seeking, just like I was, um, around shame and fear. You know, being able to reimagine yourself beyond what other people see, it's the most difficult task of all, yet the most rewarding thing if you can. Uh, because we all come into this world in a body, people with neurological difficulties, environmented or, uh, environmental or um, more impacted communities, boys, girls, boys who want to dress up as girls, girls who wear wheels, um, uh, athletes who bend their knees and sign a protest, sexually assaulted victims, uh, black, white, Asian, Latinos, us as a community right now as Muslims, uh, Native Americans, you or me, we all want what everybody wants and that is to dream and to achieve. But sometimes the society tells us and we tell ourselves that we don't fit the mold. But the very limited time I've been in this country, and that's going to be close to now 12, ye 12 years, is that we all have one thing in common, and that's being human. So we all should be fighting towards one race, and that's the human race. And you all might be wondering, why am I telling you all of this? Number one, I never imagined myself standing before wonderful people like you, adults like you, um, and sharing this part about my life 12 years ago. And two, these 12 years, if I look back, wow, it's, it's been a long journey, but it's been worth it. And this girl who was, a, who was just lived her life in fear is now a woman who's the one beginning to embrace and face that fear. So I hope by sharing this, I get to learn a little bit about all of you. And don't just to hear my story. Listen, and try to listen to each other's stories, just like I hope I listen to yours. And our stories have no ending. They have chapters, sequels, pages upon pages, and our stories must go on. And that can only happen if we help each other write it together. I always wanted to be an engineer like my father is. My older sister and I went to the same college my father went to. So not only we were the first two female engineers in our family, we were also carrying on his legacy as daughters. Both my parents really stood up for their girls, and especially my mom. She truly has made me the woman I am today. The word immigrant, that's a word that I heard in movies. I didn't realize that I will be actually titled, I'll have the label when I move here. When I came to US, I was absolutely lost. I felt defeated. I've been blessed to have managers that truly helped me see that leader aspect about me. Cyrus Tosin is a manager and associate director at IT Americas. Cyrus let me see those qualities and skills that I never thought I would see in myself. Robin Meredith Parker, she is a executive coach. I remember our first meeting, I was thinking the whole time that why am I even here? She asked me a question that I'll never forget. What does my name mean? And I'm just turning back and I'm going like, I'm sorry, we're supposed to be talking about work. I reluctantly said that it means the one who lives. And she nodded and she smiled. 
keeping a constant eye contact. And she's like, right. So how much are you allowing yourself to live, Aisha? And I'll never forget that question. It takes a village to help a person become who they are. And I think it definitely took a village. What they have done for me, I don't think I have enough words to describe my gratitude. I think the reason why things are changing is the persistence and the perseverance in people. And I'm seeing that not only in elders, but teenagers. It's remarkable what they're doing. They're the future of this country, and they're gonna bring the change that we're looking for. I think my message to other women and girls would be that the sky is not your limit. You are brilliant, you are smart, you are intelligent, and don't let anybody tell you that you're not. Yes, you are.